Hi, welcome back. What we did in the last video is we looked at a fairly detailed look at gluconeogenesis. So we looked at gluconeogenesis, and one thing that we didn't answer was how does how does oxaloacetate get out of the mitochondria? Because we mentioned it was a TCA cycle substrate, so oxaloacetate specifically exists in the mitochondria. But one thing that we know is that gluconeogenesis occurs in the cytosol. So there has to be a mechanism to somehow get oxaloacetate out of the out of the, the mitochondrial matrix or out of the mitochondria in general. But it turns out that actually oxaloacetate does not exit the mitochondria. In fact, there are there are two pathways to ultimately get into the cytosol. So Pyruvate essentially is going to start out in the cytosol, right? So uh, pyruvate kinase is in the, the, the cytosol. So ultimately, there's going to be some pyruvate out in the cytosol. But it turns out that there's no oxaloacetate transporters in the mitochondria. And you'd think that we'd be made with some, but it turns out we're not. So there are pyruvate transporters in the mitochondria. So the pyruvate that is in the cytosol is going to enter the mitochondria, right? So now I have now I have pyruvate in the mitochondria, right? So and specifically it's in the mitochondrial matrix, right? Well the first thing that's going to happen, the first thing that's going to happen is you're going to have pyruvate carboxylase, right? And if you recall pyruvate carboxylase, right? It's specifically used by carbonate, right? It used by carbonate, it used a negative charge, it used biotin. Right? It was a biotin-dependent enzyme. It hydrolyzed an ATP to ADP. And ultimately, what it formed was oxaloacetate. Right? It formed oxaloacetate. Right? So we got this oxaloacetate in the mitochondrial matrix. But like I said, it turns out that there's no, um, you know, no channels or no no you know porins or whatever there's nothing there's no way to get oxaloacetate out into the cytosol so oxaloacetate is confined to the mitochondrial matrix so what we have to do is we have to convert oxaloacetate to something that can get out of the mitochondria and so what we're going to do is we're going to run the and by the way this is an equilibrium reaction um, but I'm only drawing it in one direction to show you that it goes in this direction. And this is malate dehydrogenase. This is malate. This is malate dehydrogenase. Now, if you remember, in the TCA cycle, malate was malate was reacted with malate dehydrogenase and formed oxaloacetate. And in the process, we generated an ADH. So you can imagine that in this direction, we're going to consume an NADH. And that's exactly what we're going to do. We're going to consume an NADH and we generate an NAD. And in, in, in this direction that we're running this reaction, we're going to form malate. We're going to form malate. Squeeze it in there. We're going to form malate, specifically the L isomer. And it turns out there are malate transporters. There are malate transporters, right? So malate malate can exit the mitochondrial so oxaloacetate cannot but malate can exit the mitochondria and so now you have malate out here in the cytosol right malate is out here in the cytosol right and now malate can act or be reacted with a cytosolic malate dehydrogenase so it turns out there's a mitochondrial malate dehydrogenase and there's a cytosolic one in the TCA cycle videos, we really just look, we're really just going to look at the mitochondrial one because that's where the TCA, TCA cycle occurs. But there is a cytosolic malate dehydrogenase. And it's going to regenerate, guess what? Oxaloacetate. It's going to regenerate oxaloacetate. And from here, this is where you use pyruvate, or excuse me, this is where you use um, phosphoenol pyruvate carboxykinase. So from here, we're going to use PEP carboxy carboxykinase. And of course, in this case, we're going to burn a GTP to GDP to GDP, right? And we're also going to lose a carbon dioxide. Of course, the order in which it happens, I didn't draw it like this, but the order is it first loses the carbon dioxide, 
and then you lose the GDP, right? And what does that form? Well, PEP carboxykinase produces phosphoenyl pyruvate. So we end up with this. We end up with this, phosphoenyl pyruvate. And it turns out that that's one pathway that works. There are actually two pathways, and they're actually, they're actually very similar. Um, but what can end up happening is we're gonna, we can branch off from oxaloacetate. So this was the first pathway, and the reason we have to use this is because there are no oxaloacetate transporters in the mitochondrial membrane. So you can't transport it out of the membrane, and also you can't transport it in. It's confined to the mitochondria. So we have to convert it to another form, i.e. malate, so that we can get it out into the cytosol where gluconeogenesis occurs. Okay, and actually, one thing that, just to tie things together, glycolysis occurs in the cytosol, and remember that most of the gluconeogenic enzymes are glycolytic enzymes because they're reversible reactions. So for that reason, um, gly most of glyc most of uh, glycolysis happens in the same area that gluconeogenesis happens, and that's, of course, the cytosol. But there's actually another, um, another um, way that oxaloacetate can go, and it can actually react with a mitochondrial PEP carboxykinase. So here is a mitochondrial PEP, I'm going to abbreviate it, CK. So PE, a mitochondrial phosphoenyl pyruvate carboxykinase, and of course that's going to generate phosphoenyl pyruvate, right? That's going to generate phosphoenyl pyruvate. Well, it turns out that phosphoenyl pyruvate can also, also has transporters in the membrane of the mitochondria. So phosphoenyl pyruvate can exit the mitochondria and go into the cytosol, right? It can go into the cytosol. So what have we seen in this video? Well, it's just a follow-up video to gluconeogenesis. We really just showed you the reactions in the last video, but, but it turns out that oxaloacetate is confined to the mitochondria. It can't leave. It's, it's just a TCA cycle intermediate in there. So if you want to get it out of the mitochondria, you have to convert it to something else that can. So in the first case, we brought pyruvate into the mitochondria. And by the way, the pyruvate dehydrogenase complex also occurs there, right? But we're assuming if we're doing gluconeogenesis that that enzyme is um, allosterically inhibited, so we don't have to worry about it. But pyruvate enters the mitochondria and is consumed by what? It's consumed by pyruvate carboxylase, right? A biotin-dependent carboxylase that uses bicarbonate. And we end up generating oxaloacetate. Well, then we react oxaloacetate with a mitochondrial malate dehydrogenase, right? And that generates malate. And, but we have malate transporters in the mitochondrial membrane, so we bring malate out into the cytosol and react it with cytosolic malate dehydrogenase, and that gives us oxaloacetate. And then we react oxaloacetate with PEP carboxykinase to give us PEP. So the PEP carboxylase in this pathway was a cytosolic PEP. But it turns out that... Um, that oxaloacetate can also react with a mitochondrial PEP carboxykinase. And that, of course, generates PEP inside the mitochondria, but there are transporters for PEP in the mitochondrial membrane. So phosphoenyl pyruvate exits the mitochondria and goes into the cytosol. So here's where we have phosphoenyl pyruvate. So I hope this video cleared up anything else, that any other problems you had with gluconeogenesis. Um, in the next video, what we're going to do is we're going to look at glycolysis slash gluconeogenesis uh, regulation by a specific enzyme. It's called phosphofructokinase 2. And the reason we put PFK1 is to designate it as the one enzyme. There's actually two of them. They catalyze slightly different reactions, but it turns out that PFK2 is a regulatory enzyme, enzyme on these two processes. So see you in the next video.